and I'm kind of um, reasonably ignorant on the subject. Uh, we were hoping Greg Crowley would do the complete day uh, that he is teaching this morning. And I was thinking about it this morning, thinking well, that is useful, but I'm here because I don't know so much, because uh, you know, a little bit of ignorance helps ease everyone into it. It's going to be quite an intense few days, so I can kind of massage you slowly into <laughs> three days for room for rocky films and discussion. Um, and also because I don't know so much, I think maybe I approach it more, you know, like <coughs> like an ordinary person, a human, a human. <laughs> and I come in and I don't know much about films and kind of questions are about who is a room for rocky and what it is about. And I think sometimes there is quite a, a specialist stereotype almost around her room for rocky. In that Haroon Farrakhi is, you know, associated with you know, rigorous politics, Marxism, uh, war, uh, and particularly all those sort of you know, notions of workers, notions of Marxist production, seem to circulate. And I feel immediately uh, out of my depth in, in those circumstances. There may be a series of different levels of knowledge here. So I'll start with so the most basic for about five minutes, and move elsewhere. Uh, that he's uh, born in Czechoslovakia. Um, his parents were Indian and moved to Germany in the 20s. Um, haven't found out how he was born in Czechoslovakia, but they eventually then were exiled back to India and then with the civil war out of India into Indonesia, and then from Indonesia back to Germany. And in 1966, he ends up in Germany and goes to film school, a very famous film school, which he probably gets kicked out of, which I quite admire. It's a favorite factor from you, in that he doesn't really get to spend very long there. Um, but partly because of his uh, political attitude, partly because of his attitude towards film, I think. And he goes to Berlin and becomes involved in the Berlin film scene, and also becomes deeply entwined with the uh, Berlin magazine film critic, uh, which Ben Bender and others the German filmmakers at the time are all involved with. A bit like Kai Ada Cinema, but not as, not as well known, but uh, he has remained uh, firmly attached to the, the history of that as well. Um, and he started off really in those early films as the context of the 60s and the Vietnam War. And you could see he was a filmmaker very influenced by Jean-Luc Godard. And he keeps going back to Jean-Luc Godard and said, no matter what he makes, he finds that Jean-Luc Godard has made it 15 years before. And so there's a certain feeling of uh, constant admiration for Godard and his constant movements, which is interesting because not many people remain faithful to Godard in the past about 1980, and especially in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, his reputation has sunk a lot him, um, but uh, Farrakhi is very faithful to that. Farrakhi is fascinated by the CIA's photographs of the Auschwitz camps that they discovered in the 70s. They go back with the early reconnaissance photographs and find all the photographs of Auschwitz that were ignored by the British in the 1940s, either because they thought they were factories or they just didn't want to know. And the CIA actually uncovered a lot of the history of resistance within the camps by re examining the photographs <coughs> And this hidden history. And Farrakhi is fascinated by that, but also by the Nazis, who are so obsessed with cinema that Goebbels keeps making films, even as they're about to be defeated. There's a beautiful sort of description in a film called Kohlberg, and right at the end of 1945, Berlin was being attacked and destroyed, and Hitler and Goebbels had a, a film crew on the edge with the German army recreating the Napoleonic battle. Uh, on the end of the thing, <coughs> they built a little town, but then you know, the German army has Napoleon. <coughs> They were destroyed uh, for the film, while Berlin was being destroyed around them. And when they finally finished the film, the most expensive film ever made up to that point, and there were no cinemas left to show it because they'd all been destroyed. So they showed it in a kind of a bunker somewhere, you know, left near Norway, because everything else had been wiped out. But they still kept working on this because they felt this was the ultimate thing that they had to keep doing. Um, so I think he, uh, Harakhi is fascinated with these kind of moments where cinema and film come together. And I think in the film we're going to see, you see how that develops from the Second World War through to the present, where actually the weapons themselves begin to have their own eyes through cameras. And the people who are operating the weapons are no longer even close to the battle, but are maybe you know, across the channel, miles away, maybe in America, but they're firing something in Iraq. And he begins to follow that from the Second World War through Vietnam, and then into the First Gulf and the Second Gulf War. I'm going to give all this information that has particular kind of particular visual understanding of something, and yet, where does it go beyond that? Is, or is there actually anything to go beyond it other than just making these connections? And obviously in terms of how, so you might say that sort of, these sort of um, computer-based ideologies, whereby that's, that seems to be what the whole operation is about, is just making these connections. 
and that filters into uh, a human thinking about what that process is and how that actually operates in there. You know, later you still have to be political, because at the end, you know, he says that the weapons are being used against third world countries. You can, you know, in some ways it isn't a war, it's more like a kind of pyrotechnic uh, arms sort of show, in a way, you know what I mean, like the first of our rap war especially, you know what I mean. And obviously people died, but well, that was just like, you know, in some ways an effect of the war. Yeah, a byproduct of the kind of like, you know, the technology kind of thing, but it was just sort of show, you know what I mean. This was a study of television news content, content and public understanding about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We looked at the early years of the Intifada from, uh, from the year 2000 until about 2003. And we then did focus groups, we had a very big grant from the Social, Economic Social Research Council, so we did focus groups and interviews and questionnaires all over the country to try and work out what people understood and where they were getting information from and what they believed and why they believed what they did. And we combined this with a very big analysis of television content. So we did the study of, uh, of uh, the media. And what came out, or what we were particularly interested in, was the issue of how the public initially understood this conflict and, and how much that understanding was being structured by what they saw on the television. And you probably know that television is the main source of people's memories, understanding on, on, on all world events. If people haven't got any direct knowledge of an issue, or if they're not part of some specialist group, or educational group that's involving them, TV tends to be the dominant thing. If I say to you, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what comes into your head? What image comes into your head? You, you, I mean, about 70%, 80% of people will say it's an image of violence, fighting, war, conflict. And then you say, where does that image come from? People meet so television news. In a conflict like that, you obviously realise that, that, that there is an enormous propaganda war going on alongside the real, actual that there was a huge public relations uh, set of events and activities which are financed to attempt to influence public opinion, particularly in, in, in the West. And it's the case that if you look at Israel, is going to, in a situation like that has enormously more resources than the Palestinians. They're able to spend huge amounts of money on, on public relations. They're also uh, in a situation in which they have uh, a greater political access to, to Western leaders and to influential groups in the West. I'm not wanting to, to say to you that there's only one side that should be shown in this at all. Obviously, my, my perspective on this is that the, the, the television is bound, should, be, should show both sides, and, and that's their duty to do so. But the point is they don't, and that has very profound effects on public understanding. That's what our books suggest. And my <coughs> view also is it's not that hard to give both sides. It's not a quick like if you talk to journalists and say, oh, you can't give a history, but it's so difficult to go into history. And, all and really, it's not. They're tapped guards, and there's an absolute unanimity of what was being said. You know, that, that they, had, they were attacking Gaza because they kept being attacked, because the Palestinians kept firing rockets at them, that they had to defend their country that no civilised democracy could take having rockets fired at it all the time, all sorts of things. And, of course, what you don't, and the, and the news very faithfully represented those views again and again and again. What they don't say is that the Palestinians, you know, from their perspective, have been under attack by the Israelis for, for years, you know, before the attack on Gaza. But before the, the, the narrative is of retaliation. Yeah. Yeah? So, I think that, as a viewer, understanding that and um, it kind of it makes sense if there are certain sort of cultural cues around to validate that idea of retaliation that it's sort of um, and that there are certain cultural narratives about who is being persecuted and they build up over time and to change your mind it's like to change your mind about somebody an individual who's been victimized requires a kind of a really deep rethinking of who they are and in a way, it's the same. It strikes me it's the same thing with a nation to really rethink 
but what Israel is, means to really rethink, and this is, I suppose, what's happening more recently, is to rethink our notion of them as victims. You know, it's quite a radical step to change your mind about someone's sort of core character. Is that, you know, it takes quite a risk. It's difficult, and I think that's kind of part of the, the issue with the way that news is revaluating that? Yeah. Do you and see I what think, I mean? Yes, I do indeed. Changes. And I think a lot of Israeli public relations is designed to sustain that image mm -hmm. of them as being, uh, being the, 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 the oppressed of victims, even though they are actually running a military occupation, that they want to present themselves as being under attack. Mm -hmm. Well, they're perpetuating that within the education system. It's taught from five years old about the Holocaust in school and how within Israeli society this it to let go of a victimhood status is quite a big thing to do. Like, at the same time, yeah, but, it, but also as the person, like as the person that is victimised, then the person that you identify as the victim as well. I mean, yeah. Like I think there's like I don't know, you know the, the education is not just within Israel, but also kind of we perpetuate. 